Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be this morning here in this conference uh, in memory of Rita Levi Montalcini. I really would like to thank those who convened this meeting, especially Viviana. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, a new approach to oceans virtual embodiment. So I will start by telling you what's to be what's been in a virtual world. So uh, virtual reality it's a digital reality that is uh, in which we can inhabit. It can uh, surround us completely. It's very different therefore from a normal screen. Um, it, um, it, we have, when we are in it, we have a stereoscopic vision, it tracks our limbs, it can display in different uh, sensory systems, as we will see now, and it determines the, what we see depending on our head position. Therefore, objects are three-dimensional, so it's, it's uh, very different. This is an image from the Matrix, which brought to the uh, imagination of many people what it was to live completely in a, in a virtual environment while the bodies were uh, connected to this world through their brain activity. So therefore, it's all created by a computer, and this brings, uh, opens very interesting questions about uh, what is this, the, the reality, what is reality made of, how much of we perceive is actually there, how much is actually generated by our own brain, or even how much is there that we don't even know about like infrared or ultrasound because we don't have transducers for that. So therefore, virtual reality makes us think about the reality, the nature of reality and also of consciousness. So, for example, in this image you can see how we can feel the wind, but maybe someone is tricking us and delivering this wind from the outside. Uh, also, we can measure how much is created or fill up, as we say, fill in by our own brain. For example, this image is of an experience in a library some 20 years ago, a virtual library, where people just navigated and afterwards they reported often sounds, even when it was a silent environment, because the brain fill in this auditory information that was expected to be there. So therefore, it can also be a very interesting tool in neuroscience. So we are in this environment uh, where our reality, uh, all the visual, the auditory, tactile, olfactory, our own proprioception, even the feeling of pain, the, I mean, the delivery of pain or temperature can be delivered, can be created by a computer and we can be by, uh, in this uh, virtual, completely virtual reality. So a, a very interesting aspect to it is that we respond to it as if it were real. And this is very well known. So you may think, well, I, I know it's not there, right? But however, this image that you have here is the pits room where uh, people were asked to do a task. As you can see, there is a hole in the middle. They were asked to do a task going on to this, uh, picking up a box from that chair. And uh, very carefully, people that didn't have fear of heights, everybody, even when it, they knew it was not real, they walked very carefully around the border. Uh, this was even enhanced when there was some tactile correlation where they felt this border in their feet. So if there was another sensation, not only visual, but also tactile, they even they would, they, they would do this uh, more. So we respond to it as if it were real, and we call this to be present in virtual environments. So for example, I filmed this in a commercial center. These kids, they know they, they are in a commercial center, they put this head-mounted display, but they are responding to it as if it were real. So because, uh, because we respond to it as if it were real, uh, virtual reality is being, uh, is, has been used in therapy and is, has been used to transform emotions, uh, which is the topic. So for example, these are some images from the use uh, to treat a post-traumatic stress disorder by exposure therapy. So people can recreate this space, go into it, and then learn to modulate their anxiety, their stress. And this has been used also, for example, for fear of flying, because going into this virtual representation of a place that one is scared of, of this situation, there is what is called a place illusion, and one can learn to control this fear of flying, or fear of heights. This is from an experiment where we did that people would go up in an elevator 
and uh, we studied well in this case how music can also help with this response to it. So these are all examples that we can respond to places, right? Uh, as if they were real, but we can also respond uh, to people. So uh, many people have fear of uh, speaking, and uh, if I would ask you, how would you feel if you would uh, speak in front of these very cartoonish avatars? You would say, well, you know, this is a joke. It's, they are very simple. However, even, uh, I mean, experienced speakers participated in an experiment and they had to give a talk to this positive audience that they pay attention, they lean forwards, they even clap you in the, in the middle of your speech versus this negative audience that they, they yawn, they cut, they, they put their feet on the table, they walk away in the middle of your talk and, and even when they are cartoonish um, they, they found very difficult to uh, speak to this kind of audience. So, therefore, there is a reaction to other avatars. Uh, there is a response to it, even if they are not very realistic. Nowadays, this is from another study ongoing. In the lab, we can make better avatars, but I can tell you that with simpler ones, one can get these responses. And this is... Uh, a more extreme response. This is a study uh, by Daniel Freeman et al. in 2008, uh, studying how people respond with paranoid thoughts to people in a, in, a, in a subway. So actually they found that the number of, the amount of paranoid thoughts that were not by paranoid people but by general population, some people created this, uh, had these feelings that people had bad thoughts about this, they were criticizing them and so on with the avatar. So there is a response also to people. Okay, but how about our own body? So we have, a, we have a body, we carry it our whole life, we look down, we see this body for what we call a first person perspective, as you can see here in the image, and of course, it's a very important element of our own representation. So we, studied, we started the study some years ago to what extent we could feel that that virtual body was our own. And we work on, based on a phenomenon called the rubber hand illusion, where if one provides uh, visotactile correlations with a rubber hand, one could feel that rubber hand as part of their, own, uh, of their own body. So we did this with a virtual arm, and we saw that when this stimulation is synchronous, as you can see there, uh, there was an illusion of ownership uh, of this uh, hand, virtual hand, that can be measured in different ways. And, uh, however, this illusion is not created when this stimulation is asynchronous between the visual uh, information and the tactile information. We did the same with uh, some colleagues in, in Italy uh, using a, a, a glove that could measure the movements. And in this case, we did visual motor correlations, not visual tactile, and the same phenomenon occurred. So if we have these proper correlations with the virtual body, there is a strong illusion that this is a part of your body. And it's not the case when this is asynchronous. Okay. So, we moved on from the arm after several studies to check this on the whole body, as you can see here. And here I can point out to several elements. One is the first person perspective, therefore you look down, you see your body. Uh, here there is also a reflection in the mirror. There is a correlation of movements, which is proprioception, motor, visual information. So there is a number of sensory and motor streams that are coherent to your brain and your brain cannot resist to this. It's, it, this is my body, it has to be my body. So uh, this illusion over uh, many years we have been exploring different impacts that it has, for example phys on physiological responses. We have worked on the modulation of pain, how pain threshold can be modulated if we transform this body. Or, as you can see on the top, how uh, one can respond with anxiety if your virtual body is going to be harmed, you are going to move away for sure. It has some impact on cognition, the two examples that I will show you now and also on emotions and behaviors. So um, 
one possibility is to get into the shoes of another. So I told you we can feel this virtual body as our own, but it does not require to be our own representation. So people often ask me, you know, but we want to do this, but with my, with the real avatar. And, and this can be done very well. Today, with some photographs, there can be personalized avatars. But this is not always an advantage. And, uh, and one possibility also that is very interesting to explore in virtual reality is that you can have a different body. And in fact, you can also experience situations from the perspective of someone else. And we can do that between other things, because as I said, our brain receives these different afferents. And if they are coherent, it's going to assume this body that fulfills an amorous rules is the body uh, of this person, but is flexible with other things. For example, the shape, or the size, or the color, or the gender. So uh, this is from a study in our lab where people embody the body of a child. So there was a smaller size, obviously, but also a, a shape of a child, more roundish. This was compared against a small human. So it was separated what is the shape from what is the size. And there was a very interesting cognitive effect that some of you probably remember from, from your childhood, which is that after this experience of a few minutes, uh, there is a recalibration of size. So when people had to estimate size, they overestimate. So everything looks a little bit bigger. Yeah, so, so therefore, this is a cognitive effect that we can measure, which is a consequence of having a different body. Uh, there has been also several studies on changing race. So what happens if we inhabit the body, for example, of uh, someone of a uh, black uh, race? So um, there has been different studies. For example, the one here on the left is from a uh, is, is one in our lab where people did uh, Tai Chi classes in a virtual environment for several days, inhabiting people of, uh, of different races. And it's very consistent as in our lab and also in other groups that there is a decreased racial bias. And we are talking about implicit racial bias that can be measured with a specific tests, which are well known and validated implicit uh, racial bias in this case. In this case. And, uh, and then one it has an implicit change. And this is what we look for uh, with these uh, experiences, changes that are not explicit. People don't have to think about it. But they are implicit. They have this association. And then they are going to present this kind of changes. So it's a, a very good illustration also of the, uh, the plasticity of our brain to assume these different bodies. And then, uh, well, there is some uh, consequences. So I'm going to tell you in this last part how being the other can change, uh, can change the self in a way. So this is from a recent study, also from people with our lab in collaboration with the police in the United States that were precisely interested about these, um, uh, these effects on the implicit racial bias. And this is a, a experience, a, a study done with the police as subjects. And, uh, and what they did was to have a, a session where there was a person who was arrested, and then there was some verbal uh, discrimination um, uh, speech given to them. And then they would uh, have this experience of, of being in the position of the, the receptor, in this case, of the arrested person. So they could have this experience from a different perspective. And this, I remind you, they were policemen. And then there was a second session also in VR where they had to show uh, uh, there was a situation where they had to act. And they had a larger helping behavior toward people that had this kind of aggressions. So this is a, a, a typical effect when one gets some kind of uh, implicit association to a different group. 
And then the last part, in the last minutes, I want to tell you about a work that uh, knowing that we had this kind of tool and this potential, we started this work uh, in 2010 thinking, so how would it be if uh, people that have a violent behavior, uh, specifically in the area of domestic violence, what would it be, how would it be the effect if they could be they could feel, they could experience what is to be in the side of the victim. So, uh, well, we were, of course, um, uh, moved by the fact that there are 30% of women uh, worldwide uh, that have experienced violence by a partner, and 38% of all murders of women are committed by intimate partners. So it's, it's a, a problem that uh, takes place more or less all over the world with not so different numbers. And, uh, and then we thought of this uh, basic idea. So what happens if we pl place aggressors in this perspective? And this was uh, the approach. So the idea was to create this environment where there was a, 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 this kind of psychological, not physical abuse. There was a confrontation there. And, uh, this passed automatically, and then um, there was a, a, a perspective that one could take. So to do this, uh, we had actors, they acted the, ski, the, the scene, the, the script was, uh, or when we do it, is, is co-designed with experts working in this area. And then uh, there is this session of embodiment, as I showed you before, in front of a mirror in this case, getting familiar with this new body, uh, being able to have all these sensory motor correlations. But the one doing this is a man that now is going into this uh, body of a woman and has this first person perspective that I told you about. And this is the kind of situation. So uh, there is this, uh, a woman is there in the house and then uh, this a man enters and starts having this derogative speech offending her and, and Callate. it has uh, some response, it's a bit interactive because it can uh, uh, say shut up or it can say look at me because there is the tracking of the, of the head so if the person looks away can say hey look at me and then there is violence against an object, not against a person, and then there is an invasion of the peripersonal space. So this is uh, one of the environments. Here you see it moving because it's an actual person looking around the environment, so this is how we move our head. And I will let hey. it play just a little bit. What are you doing? I said, what the hell are you doing? Have you seen yourself in the mirror? I mean, where do you think you're going looking like that, huh? You shut up. You could put some effort in and dress up or something. Look at me. Jeez, you look 20 years. Okay, so I'll show a little That's bit gonna more stop here. right now. Do you see that phone? Do you fucking see it? Yeah? Well, there goes the fucking phone. And you can forget about your fucking mobile as well. Okay. And then I will just play you know what? a this closer is the situation. My fault. This is all my fault. I've been too soft on you. Yeah. I've been too, too patient. But you know why? Because I love you. So, we, as I said, we started this in 2010, and the first thing we studied in control men with no history of violent behavior, just to make sure to see how people responded to it, whether they, they really felt the situation as credible, whether they felt they could embody the body of a woman, whether they responded, it was believable, they responded to it. So we did these uh, studies, then we moved on uh, sometime later to work with aggressors, collaborating with, with uh, groups working on rehabilitation. Later on, we started collaborating actually with the Justice Department and, and it started the integration 
of these uh, experiences in the rehabilitation programs and therefore with the idea that they are a, a useful tool for the therapists and nowadays is, uh, is begun to be integrated in the rehabilitation in prisons, especially in modules where they work with the empathy. So I will just tell you uh, a couple of words about, uh, so in, in control men, we observed that we proved, for example, that first person perspective had advantages over third person perspective. And uh, we saw that, that uh, they could embody the body of a woman, that they would respond to it, and that first person was better. And then uh, because this is about emotions, I wanted to tell you that one of the effects uh, which is uh, very interesting and we have found in offenders is that in general, um, uh, uh, people with violent behavior is being reported and we have found also consistently there is a deficit in emotion recognition. And then we measure uh, emotion recognition in a face body compound test. And uh, what we found is that uh, if we did test before and after having this kind of experience, uh, this, control, uh, this group of, of offenders uh, that had a deficit uh, of, uh, over, uh, uh, with respect to the controls, a deficit in the recognition of fear in the faces of, of males and females, they had a change such that after the experience there is a change in their emotion recognition. Let's say that it improves the emotion recognition. This is important because emotion recognition and emotion expression, they are very linked and is connected with the, is somehow one of the building blocks of empathy. So there is this effect that we have observed uh, very consistently. We have worked also on the brain basis in collaboration with a group of Beatrice de Gelder and there is some activation of the default mode network after the experience and this uh, appears to be related with this uh, identification of emotion. So, of course, there is no time now to tell you. I think it, it's an uh, illustration of the potential of this approach. We have also used, for example, the perspective of a child in the same uh, case of the of situation, because this is also an important uh, piece of information. Uh, also, how people respond when there is this kind of violent uh, situation, but they are in a third person position because it's important that people uh, somehow learn how to intervene. So there are a number of different possibilities that can be used in this direction. So just a few conclusions. Virtual wor worlds therefore can evoke real emotions and uh, for this reason they can be used in psychological therapy. It can allow having this perspective taken. And both uh, experiencing the other's person uh, perspective changes our emotion and emotion recognition in the others. And this has different applications. As you can imagine, uh, a potential being uh, reducing, and this is what we would like, uh, violent behaviors. And of course, in virtual reality, we can uh, do many things. We can say the imagination is the limit because everything is flexible, it can be changed. And we can use, for example, uh, personalized avatars, as I mentioned later. So this is from an experience where one can have their own avatar and have a conversation with themselves, which is also uh, an interesting situation that is also helpful in some situations. So finally, I would like to thank also all the collaborators along these years that have participated in different projects and the funders. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bobby. Very interesting.